Mayor Heinrich is probably one of the more extraordinary people living in this area. Um, he's come out with his 20th book and he's led an extraordinary life and he's still living it. Very viable, very sustainable. Quite a few years ago he was told to give up his favorite extracurricular passion which is running. He still holds a number of records. He won the 100 kilometer in Chicago 40 years ago when he was 41 and it's a record for that age group that still stands. Uh, he's still running. He's been an accomplished uh, biologist, entomologist, uh, PhD. He was with Ron Cullenberg at Orono where he got a start and then he uh, went to UCLA, uh, got a doctorate in biology, entomology at um, UCLA, taught at Berkeley for a number of years, University of Vermont, and still teaches a course which is hosted at his home in Perkins Township every year for the University of Vermont students who take um, a number of days there to conduct it. Um, it so he has blended together uh, quite artfully uh, two of his strongest interests, entomology, biology on the one hand, and extraordinarily long distance, I think they call it ultra marathon running on the other, and the outcome is a book that just came out a few weeks ago called Racing the Clock, Running Across a Lifetime, so it's my privilege to introduce Baron Heinrich. Thank you, Paul. It's nice to be here again. And uh, it's kind of a coincidence, actually, that uh, we got together again. Uh, I was at uh, <coughs> the Vaney Doak uh, checking out on, on the book to see if it had been uh, uh, out at the bookstore yet because the publisher hadn't sent me any copy and they said it had been out for, for a month or so. And uh, <coughs> So um, I, and they had them for sale and I bought one of my books. So now I had a copy uh, and, uh, and I was surprised to see uh, the, the title. It, it, my original title had been uh, Racing the Clock, um, Running uh, Through Nature. And, and the title was Running uh, Through a Lifetime. Now <clears throat> Racing Across a lifetime, I guess, but uh, uh, I hadn't uh, quite yet run across the lifetime, uh, <laughs> and so I was a little bit surprised. Anyway, so so I gave the book to Paul, and uh, and so he said, you know, come give a talk. So I didn't really know, you know, what I would be talking about. I had no idea, you know, what I should be talking about. He didn't give me any hints. Uh, <laughs> But then I <clears throat> consulted my, my sister, Mary Ann Perry, who is in Reedfield, and she says, well, you know, you, <clears throat> you're a biologist, you, you should be talking about uh, global warming. He says, scientists should be uh, concerned about that. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm not for global warming, I'm again it. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, I think we should cool off real fast uh, any time we possibly can. Uh, and uh, I, I, I haven't really kept up with the topic, uh, you know, all the ins and outs and arguments. But I do remember one time <coughs> uh, reading about uh, a theory about, uh, you know, I guess we're eating so much beef and, and it comes from cows and the cows flatulate and they had methane and so uh, global warming was due to, uh, to cows farting. So uh, that, uh, <coughs> that didn't uh, 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 calculate out. I don't think we can blame the cows. I think we should blame ourselves. So, you know, I was, I was thinking about, you know, over, you know, uh, a lifetime, not quite, 
Uh, you know, trying to calculate um, how much, how many beef critters I indirectly killed and calves and pigs and sheep and, and whatnot and, uh, and uh, how many uh, uh, huge amounts of energy I have consumed in terms of the uh, carbon that has been laid down since life began in terms of coal and, and gasoline and, and, and all of how much of that I have released, you know, just driving over here, uh, but over a lifetime. <coughs> and uh, so uh, <coughs> it seemed that uh, that we, <coughs> we all are responsible uh, just by being around and uh, and uh, just by reproducing so it seems to me you know uh, one of the first things is to have fewer kids to uh, 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 attack this problem over the long term and that be fairly short term uh, so uh, but you know I can't really be uh, uh, a model in, in this regard because you know I've had four kids myself so uh, but maybe I wasn't quite so aware of it so consciously aware uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it wasn't so much an issue that that people would uh, focus on but you know I think personally I think that's that's the only way it's going to be solved if we are going to have a decent living and do what we want to do uh, <clears throat> We have to reduce our consumption, uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's one way. But it seems to me also that we should have a, uh, a, a more, you know, powerful rationale uh, for for doing it. And what we're really talking about is not just ourselves as human beings. We're talking about uh, all the animals on Earth and all the plants. We're talking about the ecosystem, we're talking about uh, uh, all of life which is uh, all of <clears throat> the animals and all of the plants and us interrelated. So uh, we are, you know, really practically speaking kind of like a plague, you know, uh, like, like locusts we're going over uh, and uh, consuming everything in our path and uh, <clears throat> of course uh, we can go everywhere because we're so smart we can live in any environment uh, put enough energy into it and so on we can do it but the locusts you know they eat themselves out of house and home and then they go and then they end up in the ocean somewhere because they run out of food and they have to fly off so <clears throat> we are stuck uh, on earth we are stuck in in the biological environment uh, I I a part of it and uh, so uh, what we should be really concerned with is to basically uh, mother nature that's what nature is it's mother it's our mother have to think of it in that way rather than something that we subdue it is our mother we should respect her uh, and I think you know, loving nature is a is a powerful uh, way to to look at it. But but it's something uh, that uh, starts early, like we like we just heard. It stops. It starts. Uh, we start to learn pretty much from the cradle on. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about that myself in my <clears throat> experiences here in Maine, where it really started. Uh, I remember a neighbor, uh, Phil Potter at, at Beans Corner, uh, <clears throat> he, he took me uh, to, uh, and I even remember the name, Hazel and Rule Orff uh, to uh, uh, Enchanted Lake uh, and uh, up northern Maine. Uh, I don't know exactly where it is now, but I do remember <clears throat> uh, there was a big pond and we were catching trout and getting acquainted uh, with everything around there and there was a, a, a nest of uh, 
uh, golden eagles uh, on a cliff on the other side of the lake. And uh, of course, we were catching trout. And and uh, <clears throat> one thing Phil always told about that trip, he says uh, he uh, cast a fly and 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 it got caught in the back of my head, and and he yanked it out, and, and there was a piece of meat there the size of a pea on the hook. Well, I don't quite believe that. He was maybe a little bit exaggerating. But the point is, there were stories there, and we connected it to, to the environment. And, uh, uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, uh, he also uh, took me to, uh, to, to the weld area uh, from Bean's Corner, uh, and um, I went uh, hunting there in, uh, uh, near Carthage and Weld uh, and got to know the woods. And uh, <clears throat> another neighbor, uh, Phil uh, Floyd Adams, uh, also there near Bean's Corner, uh, he uh, took me bee lining. Uh, so that's a great sport to be out in the woods uh, finding bee trees. And, uh, and, and I ended up uh, basically doing a lot of scientific research with bees. So all of that uh, uh, early experience was very, very important. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, I remember the, uh, you know, right at Bean's Corner there, there was a big uh, elm tree, uh, and up at the top there was a hole and a, uh, and a uh, sparrowhawk, <clears throat> a kestrel, had a nest there. I remember seeing that all the time, uh, you know, on the way going to Wilton Academy, uh, going by there. Uh, of course, they, they later cut it down, and nobody really uh, had, I'm sure, any thought. They did, probably didn't even know there was a, a kestrel nest up there. And if I had taken it out of the nest uh, and a baby and had it, uh, I prob it probably would have been illegal. But anyways, I, I did have a kestrel at one time later on because at the house uh, <clears throat> I uh, put up bird boxes. And uh, uh, so I could look right out the window uh, and, and actually kestrel nested right there. And also starlings <clears throat> and bluebirds and, and uh, uh, tree swallows. And uh, <clears throat> actually my latest book before this running book was one on tree swallows. Uh, uh, white feathers. I got interested in, in uh, why they carried white feathers into the nest. Why specifically white feathers when they're hard to find? Uh, and they filled it up with white feathers and I couldn't figure it out. So I had to watch them continuously <coughs> uh, at a nest and uh, I got to, to know the individual birds. They got so tame I could touch them in the nest and I could hold out a feather and they t take it out of my hand. And <clears throat> so all of this related to, you know, very early <clears throat> being acquainted with, uh, with nature and, and getting uh, to see it uh, <clears throat> from the perspective of, of another world, basically, from the world of the kestrel or from the world of the, uh, of the swallow <clears throat> and had pet crow. And my neighbor, uh, Phil Potter, who I just mentioned, he got a pet crow too, uh, and it hung around the house. And actually, mine <clears throat> uh, later on, you know, by fall they get independent. But it would still follow me once in a while down the road, practically down to Wilton. And somebody told me it sometimes showed up at the window at the at the school there. But I don't know about that. Uh, so. Um, so I think, <clears throat> I just try to make the point that I think uh, it's great for kids to be able to make a connection to nature through kind of emissaries. And I think, you know, birds are uh, very good, would be are very good for that uh, because, you know, they have to solve some of the same problems we do and, uh, and they can get uh, fairly uh, attached to people even. Uh, and people get attached to them and concerned with them. And, uh, you know, when I look back, um, I, uh, 
I, I see, for example, the, the chimney swifts, which were flying over a, a chimney and nesting there. And I don't see any more chimney swifts. I don't see any more kestrels. Uh, I don't see any meadowlarks. Uh, and, and just down the road at Beans Corner, there at the Elrich Place, there was a colony of about 50 or 60 nests of uh, cliff swallows. I don't see any more cliff swallows around. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so they, uh, so a lot of people might not even notice, you know, that things are actually changing. Uh, and uh, it's, <clears throat> it's not just the birds, but uh, <clears throat> I notice when I'm driving now, uh, I don't, my, the grill of my truck doesn't clog up with, with insects. And it used to be you, you drive uh, in a <clears throat> warm summer day and you come back and there you can see the insect splatters on your windshield and the grill. And I haven't seen that. So, <clears throat> so the uh, uh, insects and, and the birds are emissaries. And it's important to, to get to know them and to, 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 raise, uh, to raise awareness. <coughs> and uh, as for birds, I think, you know, I think it's very easy uh, just to uh, put up birdhouses, just to do a little thing to get kids interested. For example, uh, I was noticing uh, the, at the end of the Lake Webb, uh, the flats there, uh, and it's a perfect place there, I thought, for, for kestrels to, uh, to nest. But there wasn't any hollow tree there. All the old hollow trees are, uh, are cut down. So I said, well, I'll, I'll put up a bird box. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but I thought I'd better ask Linda Bean, who now owns that there. And you know, I called her up and asked her, and she, uh, she was very hesitant. Uh, she says, well, you've got to take it down afterwards. You know, here's somebody in the outdoor uh, market, outdoor uh, 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 living, you know, L.L. Bean. That's where you buy your outdoor clothes. And, and she uh, hardly was aware what a kestrel was. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, <clears throat> but anyways, uh, uh, <clears throat> for kids, you know, just making a, a bird box to put up is, is an easy thing. You've got, uh, I could, you know, do it in five minutes. Uh, all you have to do is get uh, <coughs> uh, six pieces of wood, f four sides, and top and bottom, and cut a notch in there for an entrance, nail them together, and, and you have a bird box, and you stick it up, and you could have birds right there. Uh, <coughs> could be uh, even English sparrows, so what? Uh, starlings uh, <clears throat> in open areas, uh, tree swallows, bluebirds, uh, and if it's big enough, maybe a kestrel where there's an open area. For example, the open areas here in Farmington, when you look down by the river, uh, that's a perfect spot for, for kestrels to be. And if you put up a box, you probably would get one after a while, and people would see them. There are little things that can be done uh, just to start uh, to, to get awareness of the other creatures of this earth. And uh, so I guess I will uh, leave it at that and, uh, and uh, say that, <clears throat> that definitely there is hope for, for uh, reducing our global emissions. And, <clears throat> and I think we should think about it not only in terms of ourselves, but for Mother Nature. Thank you very much. Did you figure out why they go for the white feathers? Uh, I had <clears throat> no, no definite hypothesis. Uh, no, I did not. That's why it took me uh, 10 years. I watched a, a nest uh, every year. And every year, things turned out a little bit different, a little bit different than I expected. But it was always exciting. Uh, so it's a journey that was important <laughs> and not, not the destination so much. Uh, but uh, uh, I, w one idea I had uh, only kind of after when I put the data together and tried to write the book was that possibly uh, the white feathers uh, might 
be a signal that the box is occupied. So uh, a lot of times the, uh, the uh, uh, swallows have a, have, do not have enough uh, boxes, nesting places, so they're checking them out. And, um, and they would prefer one that's not already being used because then they wouldn't have to fight for it because when they, when they fight for it, if, if there's somebody already there, there's going to be a big fight and, and that would, might waste them a lot of time. They might lose the fight and then they lose out. So that's a hypothesis, but I haven't proved it. Thank you. Yes? About 10 years ago, there was a major die-off of honeybees um, in the U.S. And, and Europe. Uh, do you have any uh, idea why that happened, or are you aware of the, the problem that they were having? Because I never, I never yeah. heard any solution. Yeah. No, I haven't <clears throat> heard the solution either. I, I had, uh, I tried to have beehives, and <clears throat> mine died during the winter too, uh, and and I I I. I, I know there was uh, the, uh, the the mites uh, were going around and uh, 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 and killing the colonies, and uh, <coughs> uh, but uh, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I've I've you know I've I haven't heard any explanation and I have a, a thought about it uh, possibilities uh, I don't know I uh, I mean <clears throat> it it could be some uh, specific <clears throat> uh, poison in the environment, uh, but I don't know any any tests. I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, insects are a big problem in, in, in huge agriculture. If you have, if you have huge huge agriculture, they, uh, and and uh, and you don't control the insect, uh, they can eat it all up. Um, because they can multiply like crazy, you know. Uh, you get uh, one pair of flies and they lay uh, uh, a couple hundred eggs and, and, uh, and after that the young and you have an explosion. So, you know, if you have a crop plant uh, where the food is all concentrated, uh, you would expect a huge population explosion. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, pesticide is is about the only thing to do unless you have some kind of a uh, way of dispersing. Uh, and uh, but I don't I don't know if if that has uh, panned out. If anybody has really looked at it, yes. I have a question that focuses more on your writing. Uh huh. And. Um, it's a, a link between your running and thinking. And the question is, do you think creatively and problem solve while you're running, or do you just zone out and focus on the run itself? Uh, uh, good question. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I often feel when, when I'm running uh, that my mind is kind of loose and unhinged. It isn't anything particular. And, <clears throat> and then things pop up. And a lot of times there are things, kind of insights that I do have. And, and then I try to remember them so I can write them down by the time I get back. So, <laughs> so it kind of frees the mind from the immediate uh, environment. And, and it makes it free. So I, I think it helps.